Good morning. Good to see you this morning. We're glad that you're here. I thought about saying it again, giving you another shot, but I figured that was the best you had, so I was <laughs> just going to let it go at that. I wasn't even going to push it. We are always thankful and grateful to, to be in your presence as well as one another's, and most of all, in the presence of God, to give him the glory and honor that he is due. And we're very thankful that you've joined us this morning for worship. Our topic this morning is You Are Forgiven. If you've uh, noticed the last two sermons, they've had sort of that um, bent to it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about you matter, and uh, hopefully you know that. We looked at 1 Corinthians 12, we talked about each member of the body and how important every member of the body is, how absolutely essential that God has made us and fashioned us together as his people. Every person matters within the body of Christ. You matter. And secondly, we talked about you are loved. Hope you know that. Uh, that is God's point, that God loves the world. He doesn't just love the world. He so loves it that he gave his only begotten son. And I, I hope that you know that. That really is, I trust that you appreciate, that is the point of preaching. It, it's not obviously just to fill time. It, it's not something that we do and check off a box. It's, it's designed by God with intention. And part of the intention is to inform you of things that you may not know. Here's what God says. Here's what you need to know. Uh, the second part, or at least something connected to that, is to confirm with you, agree with you. There are things that you know to be true, and hopefully preachers will stand up and say, yeah, you're right. That's exactly what God says and teaches, and we need to know that, believe that, and live that. But at least part of it also is to change your mind about what you came believing. And if it's the case that you weren't believing that you mattered, well, hopefully God's Word changes your mind about that and you leave differently than you came. If you believe that you weren't loved, then hopefully hearing God's position on that and how much He loves you changes your mind about that and you leave differently than you came. And we hope that that'll be the case this morning. Many of God's children struggle with understanding and accepting the fact that they have been forgiven by God. And as a result of that, hopefully, we'll talk this morning and we'll study together, and by the end of it, hopefully God's Word will at last give you the relief that you seek and provide you the opportunity to move forward in your life, walking with Him, growing in Him, loving Him as He loves you. Now, I don't have to tell you that the subject of forgiveness is a huge subject. In fact, you just say the word, and there's probably several thoughts that run through the minds of every Christian of things that are important to that topic. We need to talk about A if we talk about forgiveness, and you need to make sure you mention B if you talk about forgiveness. I appreciate that, and so we'll make no attempt this morning to exhaust this subject. <laughs> we won't. <laughs> Maybe another day, though, we'll talk about receive, uh, giving forgiveness, because certainly that's another topic. When it comes to you and I, extending forgiveness to each other, also a huge topic and certainly bears mentioning, but it's not our subject this morning. Our subject this morning is receiving forgiveness. You are forgiven. That is really the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is about forgiveness. That's the gospel he wants us to take into all the world. The invitation from Christ for people to come to him, the reason they're coming is to receive forgiveness. He says, I will, I will lighten your burden. I'll give you my yoke and take my burden. And it's me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest to your souls. That is the point of coming to Christ. That's his invitation. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, that's why you need to come, because Jesus will forgive. But if you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, our very hope of heaven rests on our being forgiven. That's why we look forward to that day. It's because he's forgiven us. And so you need to know that, accept that, understand that, and at last live in that reality. This morning, you are forgiven. This evening, why we struggle to accept it. Why do we struggle to believe that? Now, I tried to get all of that in one sermon. That was not going to work, 
And so come back this evening, we'll make the application as to why it's a struggle in the first place. But this morning, let's talk about the fact that if you've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Let's begin here in Matthew chapter 9. We had read for us our Lord getting in a boat crossing the sea, and they bring someone to him, a man who is a paralytic lying on his bed, and Jesus seeing their faith. Another topic, another day. It's interesting. It's not his faith that he saw. It's their faith. But Jesus said, son, thy sins are forgiven. And the Lord is going to say he did that intentionally to evoke the very response. Notice verse number three. Some of the scribes said to themselves, they didn't say it out loud, they said it to themselves. What did they say? This man blasphemes. And then they ask a question. Verse number four, Jesus knowing their thoughts and said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? They think that he is blasphemed. Other accounts will add, who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus asked him, why are you thinking that in your hearts? Now, the fact that he knew what they were thinking in their hearts should have helped them understand this is God, because only God can read hearts, 1 Samuel 16, 7. But he does read their hearts. He knows what they're thinking. But here's his explanation. Notice verse number 5. Jesus says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven? or to say, get up and walk. Please understand what Jesus is saying is, for him, one is as easy as the other. It's as easy for me to say, take up your bed and walk, as it is for me to say, your sins are forgiven. But he did it with purpose. Notice the very next verse. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. Jesus wanted them to know he could forgive sins. In fact, it's why he was here. Your sins are forgiven, number one, because that's what God does. Because that's who God is. God forgives. In fact, back in Exodus chapter 33 and into chapter 34, if you read chapter 33, you'll hear Moses in conversation with God, and Moses is asking God, show me your glory. Tell me who you are. He says to God, if you're not going to go with us, then if you're not going to go with us, then don't send us, because everybody in the land needs to know that you are ours and we are yours, and how will we know that? And Moses says, God, tell me who you are. And you'll go back and forth. You'll read probably 33, about 11, down to the end of the chapter. You'll hear this conversation with God and Moses. And eventually what God will say is, I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'll pass by before you, and I'll proclaim my name. I'll tell you who I am, Moses. One of the things that God says about himself is that this is exactly who he is and what he does. Exodus chapter 34 and verse number 7, part of what God says to Moses is, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. We'll not go into it, but please understand, God said three different things there, and he says he forgives each one. He forgives iniquity, he forgives transgression, and he forgives sins. It's his self-description. It's who he is and what he does. One definition of forgiveness is to bear up, to lift up, to carry. The idea of something rising and then moving away. You can see it in the ark. Genesis 7 and verse 17 is where that word is. The earth and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it was lifted up above. It was born, it was lifted up, it was carried away. That's the idea of forgiveness. But there's another one. It's in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse number 30, where the Bible says, and hearken thou. Now, this section of Scripture is Solomon's dedication of the temple, where he is going through all of these things, and he's making this prayer to God, and he's pleading with God to forgive his people when they sin. In verse number 30, he says, hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel. When they shall pray toward this place, and when you hear it in heaven, thy dwelling place, and when you hear 
forgive. This word means... <laughs> oh, Siri. <laughs> I don't know if y'all heard that, but she said, I found this on the web. <laughs> and on my watch, she had Genesis 7 brought up with the art. You know, I decided to leave my phone in my office because I said, well, the last time it got me, now I'm going to leave my watch in the office too, going forward. <laughs> this word means to pardon, absolution, formal release of guilt and obligation. It's remission, the cancellation of a debt, the charge or penalty to carry, pardon, formally release from guilt. That's the idea. Why are you forgiven? If you've obeyed the gospel, that is precisely who God is and what He does, and He self-describes as that. Number two, you are forgiven because forgiveness was always the plan. There was never any other thing God was going to do. The Bible reveals the unfolding plan of God. We've talked about this and we'll continue to talk about this because it's what the book is about. Paul refers to it as the mystery. We are introduced to sin in Genesis chapter 3, and the very first time sin enters into the world, in verse number 15 of that chapter, God is talking about redemption. He doesn't wait and get around to it. Chapter 1, chapter 2, creation. Chapter 3, sin. Chapter 3, redemption. It's the whole of the Bible. It's the plan. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 8, but Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 12, the promise is made to Abraham, a, a land, a nation, and a seed. That seed, Galatians 3.16, is Christ, the prophet raised up like unto Moses, Deuteronomy 18 and verse number 15. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up like unto me, him ye shall hear. All of the prophets subsequently thereafter, pleading for God's people, come back to me, return to me. You, if you're in Bible class in the adult, in, in this auditorium, then you've heard Hosea pleading, come back to me, come back. That's God's plea. The prophets make that plea. When at last Christ comes, he tells people, here's why I'm here. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26 and verse 28, Jesus says, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That word remission, release from bondage, forgiveness or pardon of sin, letting them go as if they had never been committed. If you've obeyed the gospel, then that was the plan. There's no plan B. That's the whole of Scripture was for Jesus to come, die for the sins of the world, and if you come to him, for him to forgive you, release you, and completely pardon your sins. That was the plan. And if you've done that, then you're forgiven. Number three, you're forgiven because God has forgiven the sins you've committed. The sins that God will, forgiven, will forgive testify to the fact that he'll forgive you. They're, I don't know that they're intended by any stretch of the imagination to be exhaustive, but they're listed so we can read and understand. And when you read things like Isaiah 1 and verse number 1 beginning to down to about verse number 15, you hear God enumerating some of Israel's sins. In fact, he compares them to donkeys, and he says the, the donkey behaves smarter than Israel. The ox knows his owner, the donkey his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people does not consider. 
When he describes them, he describes them as people who are laden, born down, bearers of sin, heavy laden, worn out with sin. He says the whole head is sick, the whole heart faint, from the crown of the head to the sole of the feet. There's wound, there's putrefied. You know, before he ends that chapter, after all of this description, verse 16, 17, and 18, he will say, Come, let us reason together. Wash you, purge you, cleanse you. Wait, all of those sins? Yes, absolutely, but that's hardly the only list. There's Romans 1, verses 18 to the end of the chapter. You know that long list of sins. There, there's 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Paul says, such were some of you. There's Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh, oh, they're manifest. They're evidence, and here they are. Here's Revelation 21 and verse number 8. There's liars, there's adults, there's all of these. Let me just share with you some of the things listed here. Paul, uh, the, that, that list or those lists include, and other sins that he's forgiven, murder, fornication, homosexuality, lying, cheating, stealing, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, disobedient to barons, unmerciful, unrighteous, wicked, malicious, envy, whispers, pride, boasters, haters of God, covenant breakers, liars, vain worship, will worship, unbelief, sexual sins, relational sins, financial sins, moral sin, unethical sin, and if that list is not enough, and I don't think it's exhaustive, Galatians chapter 5 will add the phrase, and such like. Somebody raise their hand and say, mine's not in there, and such like. <laughs> whatever you have done, whatever anybody has done, God has demonstrated His desire and His willingness to forgive it. Number next, in both covenants, he's given us an example of this very thing taking place. Sometimes people say, well, yeah, I hear what you're saying, and you know, I'm not going to lie, it sounds good, but it's not personal. No, let me give you a person. You have your Bibles. Look at 2 Kings 21. If you don't know this man, let's meet him. Sometimes people say, well, man, if I could just have a little more time, if I could just have this, if I could just. This man's father is named Hezekiah. Hezekiah was faithful to God. Hezekiah was near his death. And Hezekiah prayed to God. And Hezekiah got 15 more years of life. And it's within those 15 years of life that Hezekiah had this son. His name is Manasseh, and he was anything but faithful to God. Will God forgive? Yeah, Manasseh is an example of God's forgiveness. You began in verse number one with the duration, the amount of time that Manasseh spent in rebellion to God. Verse number one says Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He lived 43 years from the time he began his reign to the time he ended. And those 43 years were largely, predominantly, if not close to entirely spent in rebellion and sin against God. The kinds of sin Manasseh committed, they began to be enumerated. Verse number two, the Bible says, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. We'll circle back to that phrase, but notice we might say he specialized in idolatry. Beginning in verse number three down to about verse number seven, just note what the text says that he did. First, it says in verse number three, he built the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He erected altars of Baal and made an Asherah and Ahab king of it, as Ahab king of Israel had done, and worship all the hosts of heaven and serve them. Listen, we could stop right there, and this would be sufficient for idolatry. It's hard to get much more, more whole or complete than that. He rebuilt the high places, number one. 
He erected altars for Baal, number two. He made an Asherah, number three. And he did what Ahab had done and worshiped the host of heaven, the sun, moon, and stars. He did that, but that's only verse number three. He continued. Verse number four says, he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. I'll let you just chew on that one for just a moment. You remember the temple? You remember what Solomon did and what it was and what it meant to the God of heaven at last? They were going to get rest. His people were not going to wander. I'm going to put my name there. Yeah, in that very place, this man, he built an altar in the house of the Lord, but not to the Lord. Verse number five says, he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Verse number six says, he made his son to pass through the fire. Please don't read that quickly. Have tendency sometimes just read the Bible and keep on reading. No, stop. Feel that. Get a feel for that. Go back to the birth of a child. Go back to the warmth and the rejoicing and the celebration and what it must mean to hold a baby close to your bosom. Get into all of that and then see this man at some point take that child and send the child through the fire to an idol. That's this man. It's not like the king went out and got somebody else's child. Oh, that'd be awful. Kings do things, though. No, he didn't. No, this verse 6 says he made his son pass through the fire. Was he done? No, hardly done. He practiced witchcraft, used divination, dealt with mediums and spirits. The verse simply says he did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Verse number seven, then he set the carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which the Lord had said to David and to his son Solomon, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. You remember Exodus 20 and the very first thing God said to the nation? I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods. We don't just have other gods. We have them in the house of God. That's this man. I mentioned that verse number two says he did according to the abominations of the land, but that may not tell you enough. So, go back to Leviticus. Hold your hand there. We'll come back. Go back to Leviticus chapter 18. And in Leviticus 18, God is talking to Moses about the abominations of the nations in the land. And he's telling Israel, you can't do this. In fact, these are the reasons I'm putting them out. And when you get in here, you walk by my statutes. You live according to my rules. You don't live like these people. Well, that's verse 1, 2, and 3. The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I'm the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land. You shall not do what's done in the land of Egypt, where you live, nor shall you do what is done in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you. What was done in Egypt? Idolatry. What's done in the land? Well, just start reading. Verse number six says, None of you shall approach any blood relative to uncover his nakedness. Please understand, the uncovering of nakedness is sexual action. It's sexual sins. That's what's being described. And of those sins, you shall not approach your blood relative to uncover their nakedness. Verse number seven, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. That is the nakedness of your mother. Verse number eight, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. Verse number nine, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter. Verse number 10, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. Verse 11, the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter born to your father. Verse number 12, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. Verse 13, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. Verse number 18, you shall not marry a woman in addition to her sister and have her as a rival. 
Verse number 19, you should not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness during her menstrual impurity. Verse 20, you should not have intercourse with a neighbor's wife to defile her. Verse 21, you should not give any of your offspring to offer them to Molech, nor should you profane the name of the Lord your God. You should not lie with a male as with a female. It's an abomination. You shall not, you shall not have intercourse with any animal to be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. That's a perversion. But read the next few verses. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by all these, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. Verse 27, for the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations, and the land has come become defiled. Go back to 2 Kings and listen to verse number 2. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations. But that's not all. Verse number 8, the Bible says, And I will not make the feet of Israel wander anymore from the land, which I gave their fathers, if only they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to the law of my servant Moses that he commanded them. But verse number 9, the first few words say, but they didn't listen. In fact, it goes on to say, Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Wait a minute, you might ask, is that even possible? Yes! He did after the abominations, verse number 2. He did more than the nations, verse number 9. Clark says about this word seduced, and I think he captures the idea of Manasseh and his actions pretty well. He says he did all he could to pervert the national character and totally destroy the worship of the true God, and he succeeded. As a result of this sinful life that Manasseh lived, God brought judgment. Because he did these things, verse number 11, the Bible says, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abominations, has done all these things more than all the Amorites did who were before him and had made Judah also to with his eyes, sin with his idols, God brought Babylon and Manasseh was taken away. When he was taken away, would you believe he repented? Before you get there, look at verse 16. The Bible says, moreover, and again, don't read that quickly. You, you, you read from verse 1 down to verse 15, and you see this piling on of sins that this man did. They keep adding and adding and adding. And then you get to verse 16, and the Bible says, moreover. No, no, it's not done. Moreover, Manasseh, one, shed very much innocent blood. Number two, he filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Three, besides the sin that he had made Judah to sin, now he's in Babylon, and he repented. And 2 Chronicles 33, verses 12 and 13, records that repentance and God's response. The Bible says, and when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. I said this evening, or this, well, I guess that's the evening. It's five o'clock, six o'clock. Who is evening, Sister Owens? Five o'clock, some, five o'clock, thank you. I have a tendency to say this afternoon, when it's this evening. You didn't need to know that. I'm just talking out loud, so I'm thinking. Tonight, when you come back, talk about why we struggle with forgiveness. But if I could offer at least one reason here, how willing are you to forgive Manasseh at this point? 
How quickly are you saying, yeah, you know what? I'm for it. Let's forgive him. We just enumerated the things he did. We talked about how long he did it. We talked about to whom he did it. And coincidentally, it wasn't just his own son. Now, I said he sent his own son through the fire, but this verse says he shed much innocent blood in Jerusalem. That means it went beyond just him and his family. Now he is in affliction. One of our challenges with forgiveness is when people ask for it. When we look at this right here, the typical response is, oh, now he's sorry? He's sorry now because he's in Babylon? Because Babylon has come and taken him away, and now he's going to apologize? Oh, he's just sorry because he was caught. Yeah, that's precisely right. He is sorry because he's now in Babylon captivity. He comes to himself. When, the Bible says, when he was in affliction, we have a problem if when you are in affliction, you want forgiveness. But listen, we have a problem with you doing the wrong in the first place. And so our position looks like this. You shouldn't do wrong. Got it. That's true. But you did. And then you get punished. Right, because that's what you deserve. And now you're going to ask for forgiveness? So when do you want them to ask for forgiveness? You didn't want them to do wrong in the first place. That's right. They did wrong. They got punished. Now they ask for forgiveness. If not now, when do you want them to ask for forgiveness? You know you don't ask for forgiveness when you haven't done anything wrong. The man is in affliction. The Bible takes time to tell us that. When he was in affliction, what did he do? He cried out to God. You know what that means? He besought the Lord. That means the Lord was still available to be sought. He didn't just seek the Lord. He humbled himself greatly. That's an absolute requirement. Without humility and a broken spirit and a contrite heart, there can be no forgiveness. He has it. He's met God's qualifications. He prayed unto him and was entreated. That means God heard his supplication, and then God restored him. The Bible says this convinced Manasseh that God was the Lord. That convinced him. And then Manasseh was convinced. You know, Manasseh is in the Bible as an example of God's forgiveness. I'm not suggesting that you compare your sins to Manasseh. I'm simply saying the example is here. And it's very likely you've not done the things that Manasseh has done. But if you have, then God is willing to forgive. But there's a New Testament example. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 to 17. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 to 17, when the Apostle Paul talks about his former life, he says that the very reason Christ forgave him was for him to be an example that God would forgive others. Paul says he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, but he obtained mercy because he did it in ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of God was exceeding and abundantly given to him. He says, this is worthy of acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom he was the foremost. I was the chief of sinners, Paul says, and God forgave me. Verse 16 says, for this reason I found mercy, that in me, Christ Jesus might show himself and show as a model, an example of his patience as an example for those who would believe in him afterwards. The Apostle Paul is an example. It is also noteworthy when the Bible emphasizes things, and it does. The Bible says, for instance, God loves us, and that's true. It says in a multiple ways, in a variety of ways, but sometimes the Bible will place an emphasis on it. And so we read John 3, 16. The Bible doesn't say God loved the world. He gave us. No, it doesn't say that. It says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When, with regards to God's mercy and with, God, with regards to God's love, Paul doesn't say God is merciful, though he is. Psalm 136. 
He doesn't simply say God loves. He does, 1 John 4. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 4, in one verse the Bible says this, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. He is rich in mercy and has great love for us. What about forgiveness? The same thing occurs. It's not simply that he forgives. He does. But when we forsake our ways and come to him, take a passage like Isaiah 55 and verse number 7, where the Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Not just pardon. Pardon would be sufficient, but he will abundantly pardon. Will he forgive? Absolutely, but not just forgive. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Well, that's great. That would be enough, but the verse doesn't stop there. It says, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You come to God, obey the gospel, you get forgiveness and cleansing. You get pardon and abundant pardon. You get mercy and he's rich in mercy. You get love and he's great in love. That's what you get from God. Question, why are we struggling then? Why do we have such a hard time from day to day to day? We'll get into more detail tonight. But ask yourself and answer a few questions with me. Answer this one. How can the whole Bible be about forgiveness and we continue to wonder if God will really forgive us? How can God be absolute perfection? And we struggle to believe that he will forgive us when he said he did in Christ Jesus. How can we read all of the people, all of the varied sins? We mentioned two, Manasseh and Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, two people. That's all we mentioned. But all the people in the Bible that are mentioned as getting forgiveness and how can we not get it then? How can Christ teach forgiveness, command forgiveness, say he came to forgive, die on the cross to forgive, invite us to come to him, promise to forgive us, we get in him and then struggle to believe God has forgiven us? How can the Holy Spirit reveal the epistles in which every one of them in one way or another Talk about people who have been forgiven of their sins already. And we keep wandering from day to day to day. Will you believe God has forgiven you? I had a topic one time somebody gave me, and sometimes people give you topics that they think of and, and, and think would be a good topic to talk about. And, and, and the title read this way. It said, tell me the truth. Will God really forgive me? Did you get all that? This is a lengthy topic. When I get topics like that, I like to try to break down the title and the topic and make points as we go. So let's do that together very quickly. Here's the first part of that. Tell me the truth. Which when I hear that, I think, oh, you just mean you need the Bible because that's the truth. So if I tell you the truth, but you know what? It's not that simple. Why not? Because there are truths that people are told all the time and it doesn't change their life. Let me ask you this. Is there a truth in your life right now that you know you should do and you're not doing it? Oh, I don't mean something sinful, quote unquote. I don't mean that. 
I mean, do you know there are decisions you shouldn't make? It's the truth. This right here is better for you. That right there is bad for you. This right here you should do. This right here you shouldn't do. This right here, if you keep doing that, it's going to keep going. Is there something in your life? See, this is the trick that people play on themselves. They like to believe that if you just tell me the truth, I submit to you it's not nearly that simple because people are already know truths and they don't live them. So that's the first part. Tell me the truth. Okay, no problem. I'll tell you the truth. Here's the second part. Will God really, you'll want to go home and uh, really um, look at the word really. What does that really, what does that mean? Really, as matter of fact, as point of certainty, really, will God really forgive me? Will God really? Well, now, if I told you the truth, then the really part's kind of taken care of, isn't it? Really? Yeah, will God really forgive me? that's the third part. Forgive me. And so the emphasis then on, I know he'll forgive, but will he forgive me? Here's why I'm telling you all of that, because that's a horrible question. Horrible. And the question is not one that seeks truth. The question is one that, quite frankly, impugns God. It's an awful thing to ask. We just spent the last 35, 40 minutes telling you in one way or another why God has forgiven. Was that the truth? Who said it? Who did it? God said it. God did it. Well, why don't you believe it? I assure you this, that has not to do with God. That has to do with you. Here's a better question. Tell me the truth. Will you believe God has forgiven you? Because you shouldn't keep living a life where God has sent his son, die, bury, rise for you, offer his blood to cleanse, and you come to him, go through the cleansing get to the other side and ask, did he do it? That's not about him, and that's the truth. Will you believe God has forgiven you so you can move on with your life and walk hand in hand with your God? The whole point of the gospel is that if you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is inviting you to come because he will forgive you. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll forgive you of your doubt. He'll forgive you of your blasphemy. He'll forgive you of your ill speaking about him. He'll forgive you of the wrongs you've done. He will forgive. It's why you should come. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Change your heart. Change your mind. Confess the name of Jesus and be buried with Christ in baptism. That's the good news, and the good news is this. If you will do that, then he will abundantly pardon. If you are his child, I know like you know, things happen, and we get hurt, and it's difficult, and it affects our minds, and it affects our judgments, and it affects our self-esteem, And it affects how good we feel about ourselves. There's a lot of people in the world to add on and pile on and pile on and pile on. But that was the point of the last three sermons. Number one, you matter. Number two, you are loved. Number three, you are forgiven. Can you embrace it? Can you believe it? And can you go forward and live in it so we can share that good news with somebody else. We can help you in any way. We invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.